Hello boys and girls, I hope you enjoy the summer as much as I do. Uh, in this video I want to alleviate some confusion that some people have when they hear about theorems, especially in category theory, topos theory, constructive mathematics, um, which sound like they just conflict with some standard theorems they uh, were brought up with in a more classical context. I have here a list of a bunch of theorems that uh, definitely hold uh, also in a constructive context and maybe I mean you, you can take a look at that but I will also go through it um, later in the video um, if I scroll down then there's some more there's some more somewhat more surprising stuff um, and uh, I want basically the goal of this video is to make it so that this is all not so surprising because if you have uh, like the intuition, uh, in particular about computability, about the context um, where um, excluded middle might not hold, some th these sort of weaker theories in that sense, um, and get a feel for uh, the difference between like sets and set comprehension and functions and um, how the logic plays into that then uh, these things should actually not be that confusing. And at the end of this video, we'll sort of understand uh, why those things work, what the, the, the block, why the blockers are removed to certain uh, of these theorems. In the end, it's mostly about the fact that in classical logic, a bunch of structures and definitions collapse. And um, if they don't collapse, if you keep them apart, then you can formulate theorems for these objects independently and uh, they might not be the same. We will see later in the video what, what I mean here. I was actually motivated um, to make a video. Uh, initially, I wanted to make a review when I saw that this paper came out uh, by Bauer and Hansen um, just uh, this week on uh, the countable reals, so a counting function from the natural numbers to the real numbers, or rather, this is a topos theoretic context, so an epimorphism. Uh, but um, uh, nonetheless, this is like a sort of novel construction where you take the natural numbers um, as formulated in the topos and uh, you uh, reach all the, uh, the real numbers, the dedicated real numbers in particular. Um, and uh, yeah, so. I will discuss so subcountability in this video and 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 why uh, in the constructive world, for example, the a subset of the natural numbers is not necessarily countable and why that makes complete sense um, if you change the context a little bit. Um, you can he read here the abstract, um, but I will come back to it later anyway. I have also independently uh, exchanged a word with both of these authors. Maybe um, if somebody's interested, I could also try to do some interview-ish kind of content on this channel at one point. I might ask him. Um, relatedly, there is a, a Bauer paper from uh, 10 years ago already. Uh, here you see an injection from the function space n to n uh, down into the natural numbers um, again. We will see why uh, that should not be, I mean, maybe it's surprising, but why it's not impossible. Um, and uh, if you want some uh, background, uh, now 10 years ago, 10, <laughs> 10 months ago, I made this video on basically um, constructive logic, propositional logic, predicate logic and arithmetic. Um, where you get a feel how uh, working in these logics work. Basically, you have a bunch of double negations and, and uh, I show that a lot of the theorems are saved in one way or another. And here I also talk about um, the halting problem in the end as like a, a, a basic go-to um, to demonstrate uh, certain circumstances. Um, and this, is, this might also help. My video... Uh, here will, like that uh, video from 10 months ago, um, be a basic uh, compared to these papers. So I, I don't talk about topos theory. I don't talk about realizability. I basically in, am, I, am in a uh, computable context or at least computable, computable semantics are possible. I use uh, set theoretic language throughout 
and uh, it's mostly about following the logic, the formal logic. Um, okay, here, finally, before I get to my main content, I have written down here some bullet points uh, what holds in the topos. So, what does not hold this countable choice on the excluded middle, that's why a lot of things are possible. Um, but as you can see here, the topos also uh, validates some uh, non-constructive principles, uh, the analytic um, lesser limited princip uh, principle. Uh, and um, of course, um, in, um, in any situation where you have a uh, choice, I will discuss is the the, all these results are also are more restricted also with the situations for the for the topo, topoi so in the in the standard reliability topoi um i think there are some situations where uh, uh, dependent choice always holds and so these um then also behave more classical but this in this paper the construction is in particular to basically enforce the possibility of the countability of the reals okay so um, with that said, let me jump into the main content of this video. Um, yes, first off, um, you can read here a bunch of um, preliminaries so that I don't have to watch my lang language uh, uh, so much. So when I say theory, if I don't see anything else, then I'm talking about like a, a metallurgically assumed sound and uh, consistent theory. We usually have a model of the naturals, like um, if we have a standard set theory, might, might it be constructive, but it's usually then, then uh, big enough to have the naturals, to have function spaces and so on. Um, here, a standard um, model of uh, some of the numbers and that they are uh, different and standard definition of injection, ex like in terms of uh, function existence. Um, and, uh, you know, every now and then I say, I point some things out that are also possibly surprising that uh, are the case for Tamilo Frankl theory, but usually these things are then broken off as soon as you um, accept choice. And here, so for example, the, the fact that um, the order structure in terms of the injections is not the same with and without choice. Um, okay. Okay, so um, I start very softly. Um, the, what we are going to discuss um, is mostly about functions and functions, you know, the, the definition of a function, the, the function property is that for all inputs of a fixed domain, uh, there exists some output um, and the output is uh, unique for a function, right? It's a relation with unique output. So you have this for all exists uh, exclamation mark um, unique uh, relation. And this is very different than if you s uh, flip the, um, the quantifiers around, right? When, if you have some statement of the form that exists for all, then this is typically something like, like a, a boundary, right? Or some containing set or something like that. You say for, for, uh, for all things, um, you have some some object which sort of relates to to all uh, elements. Um, so you can think of relation and functions if you have for all exists, and then the other way around. You, you, like typical examples are like there's a maximum or something like that. Um, and notably, uh, unique existence, right? So you can say. Um, there exists a unique x such as uh, q of x. Um, this is uh, you know definable in in, in uh, logic terms, and you really say that there exists something, and you, the uniqueness is formulated by saying that anything else, if it also has the property q, is already that thing, right? And so, if you have unique existence, then you're really dealing with more quantifiers already, right? So there's of course then different um, formulations also of unique existence, but uh, in any case, uh, this is generally significantly more logically complicated than um, just uh, the existence because you are dealing with another quantifier. And for example, if the domain is infinite, then this gives you all the magic this, that can come with, you know, um, undecidability and so on and so forth. These cases where you cannot check all the cases. So 
this is just so to point out that uh, unique existence and thereby function existence can be very demanding. And we will see now that if we strip off some of the logic, like in particular the excluded middle, then it's just more uh, difficult to define functions right or do, to, to have the theory prove that something is a function and that's basically where the magic happens that's where then the the, um, the constructive function spaces which um, are still permitted to behave classically don't by themselves are if you will so full and um, so uh, determined as in the uh, as in the classical cases okay we will see what i mean uh, in more detail uh, in a second. Okay, so here is, uh, uh, for what it's worth, the definition of subjection and injection. And also here, like, note how um, the the um, uh, the quantifier here, the structures are, are fairly different. That's why these two notions um, are more removed uh, from each other than than. Uh, that you might grasp in in, in, the, in the first case if you study this these notions right so the, you know there's subjective injective and if it's both then it's bijective and so on and so forth but from a logical structure these things like if you look at the definitions there they look fairly different right and uh, that has a bunch of implications down the line okay so um we have set theory we have uh comprehension if you have some predicate on some domain um a then if you have a comprehension with Q, then we can define the subsets. Uh, looks like so, right? And in, um, in a set theory, everything is a set. And in particular, we might speak of functions, but uh, we, um, we, need some, uh, we need to specify some, uh, some um, implementation, if we will, from, of functions, right? We are, we, if you have a programming language or request a function, then we have one notion of function. If we have a set theory where everything is a set and where we have set theory axioms and we want to talk about functions, then we also must encode somehow the functions. And how this is done is that um, basically, uh, essentially, you, you identify the functions with the graph and the graph is some particular subset of the, this product space, right? So a function from X to Y is a certain subset of this product space, the set of pairs. And if you write down uh, this equality symbol for like the, the evaluated F, then we really mean that a certain pair is a member of this set, which is itself a subset of this product space. Um, and now uh, the function space is then written y to the x, right? And by these definitions, by the fact that function is supposed to be a subset of this product space, that means that the function space is some uh, subset of the power set of x and y, right? So um, the product x and y contains a bunch of pairs. S whole subsets of those are the functions. And uh, the power set of this product is something which contains a bunch of subsets, and there, therefore, the function space is uh, a subset here. And now, really, the the, the main point uh, that you have, if you come to constructive mathematics and have not seen this before, and the main main key and, uh, to to understand these things, um, basically, is what I will say now. The important thing is that. Um, the function space holds all the the objects that the, all the relations basically that the theory proves to be functional that have the function property right so again the function property here is that for all inputs there's a unique output such that um, and how uh, with what this this uh, y to the x is stuffed all like the 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 content of this this abstractly characterized set is uh, determined by what your theory proves to be a function, right? And so if you have a weak theory and it proves a bunch of things not to be functions, then it doesn't prove that they are in there. And in this sense, like uh, intuitively, the different function spaces in from diff like the same function space, let's say from the natural numbers to the natural numbers, as seen from different theories, can be more or less stuffed with stuff, right? So, for example, there is then um, a bunch of constructive theory where it's consistent to 
adopt a postulate that all functions from the natural numbers to the natural numbers are computable functions in the uh, cleanly sense. So basically that the function space from n to n is just the computer programs. And so from the perspective of a, a classical set theory, this function space, right, this, this n to n or n to the n, is then fairly sparse, right? I'm, I'm uh, using here intuitive language, but the, you can see that the, if the theory determines what must be in the function space, and if the theory uh, is agnostic towards this and that function being in there, and I will give examples later, then uh, the object behaves different and then some theorems that you might be familiar uh, with fail, simply because the logic is uh, weakened or changed. Okay, so uh, in particular, if we have a predicate Q, okay, on X, then um, uh, the main thing to look at is these uh, characteristic functions, right? And we are doing set theory, so we are defining um, all objects, uh, sets and subsets of SX, sets and so on and so forth. And the characteristic function also has to look like some uh, particular um, set, uh, which is a subset of the product of the domain, the, the whole domain A that you want to consider, and then some subset of A uh, is being carved out by uh, rejection or acceptance, right? So for example, if I say um, uh, all the prime numbers, then the characteristic function is the function which would be zero on non-primes and one on prime numbers, right? So um, you can then uh, characterize this like this. Okay, and here um, I, um, I explain the notation. So the, 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 the candidate for the characteristic function of the set theory is this, um, should I actually go into this and correct this? Uh, yeah, okay. So this is the, the script um, just for the sake of being less confusing. Um, I just have here P and X and Y and I, I don't want to use these different symbols. Um, so, okay. Okay, so here I just uh, corrected this this p to this pair. So the 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 candidate for the characteristic function is the collection of all pairs. Uh, in this product set um, such that if Q holds uh, like proof at least true th uh, for this X then um, put one into into this um, into this pair uh, or if it's false then put the zero there right so this is how the the characteristic function always looks for some predicate uh, if you take the values uh, 0 and 1 as true and false. Um, this is as a, as a set how this always looks, right? The function is some, some set of pairs. And now the thing is this, if um, Q uh, holds, then as I just explained, then uh, for A, then this, this pair is, is in it. If Q does not hold, then um, the, this pair is in it, right? And so assuming excluded middle for Q of A, right? Then in either case, there is some, uh, some Y value that will actually be one over zero, such that this pair is there, right? So here, um, this, this, uh, the conjunction, the, the like together, this, this statement and this statement has a lot of information. Here, I basically weaken it, I make the dis disjunction, and I, I point out that if the excluded middle for this holds, if either of those must be the case, then in, in, in both cases, there is some value such that there is some pair in it, right? And so this, this statement holds. So exactly when you can, um, for, the, for this characteristic function um, definition, exactly when you can prove that this disjunction holds, then there's a unique return value for the function 
So if Q is decidable in this sense for, uh, for all values, then exactly does this set model the characteristic function, right? Um, and of course, the important thing is that this thing might not be provable in a theory that does not uh, like automatically assume excluded middle, right? But so this is the this is the here these important constructions to understand why some 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 functions might be lacking, so to speak, right? They are not really then functions. Yeah, you depends which which uh, theory you want to take have the primary role and dictate what function means. But um, uh, here here the, you see the explanation why the logic dictates how full in a sense the function space is. Okay, okay. I give you a very simple example of. Um, multiple of seven before I have talked about prime numbers and now I talk about uh, multiples of seven is even e simpler um, and the um, in arithmetic already um, you can do your proof theory and then you see for certain particular like especially the, um, the quantifier free statements these can basically be implemented by primitive recursive function. And if you have some quantifiers, then it might be a little bit more complicated. But essentially, if you look at something like recursion theory, as first approximation, this is basically logic plus while loops. And you have the correspondence with uh, certain predicates being representable by some function here. And um, I code up here an example in Python syntax. So again, I talk about uh, the, the domain n and then this simple uh, statement uh, is the natural number multiple of seven here encoded as the existence of some number such that this number times seven is the number that you provided. And then um, the, uh, the excluded middle statement for that um, in the standard numerals uh, is, I mean, this is so simple that you can even, you know, write your uh, small primitive recursive script. Um, in this case, uh, the you can always actually compute what, what uh, M is because you can basically try it out and you know, uh, like, you know, uh, in a common sense way um, that you don't have to go too high because after a certain point, uh, all the candidates are gone. Um, but depending on what your formulation is of your theory, and then that might be like very um, you know abstruse, and then you design some nice theory and proof to make things that should be trivial, trivial, and so on and so forth. Okay, this is not really about proof theory or recursion theory, but this is just here giving an example for something that's clearly um, uh, primitive recursive in the standard numerals, and um, in general uh, in if you adopt excluded middle, then as I said, this will never fail. And so basically all uh, characteristic function candidates in this set, in this classical set theory are also immediately functions, right? So basically the description or the task or the hope <laughs> or the graph um, of a problem, right? The problem being in the sense Q here, the predicate, just the description of the, the, the set for this problem in this theory is by excluded middle automatically functional, right? Because the, the, the return values are by design finite. And so this is always a function. So basically all wishes or descriptions of characteristic functions are immediately also characteristic function. And so uh, in a the classical theory, you do not actually have to be able to implement it in Python, right? So uh, this, this is your, the, the dividing line. If you accept ex um, the, the classical logic, the, ex the excluded middle, then the, the, there is actually not a demand that you uh, are able to, to implement it. If you do not accept it, then if it's implementable, then it's surely a function if it like models arithmetic in a sound way. Um, but um, there's also in between ranges, right? So you might throw out excluded middle and then um, adopt axioms uh, or, or um, principles that give you a sort of hyper computation in between. That not every every characteristic function uh, description is a is a function, but um, you might like tune your axioms to get stuff in between, and then you get certain systems where not everything that uh, the classical theory says is a function, but certain objects which are not even computable in this Python or cleaning sense are. So right, so there's an, a whole 
new world of, of, of stuff. And uh, the realizability um, theory stuff, the, the topos theory stuff goes in this direction, right? There you have basically uh, like a spectrum of, of, of worlds. It doesn't have to be like that you accept the church touring thesis, the constructive fund. There's only, um, there's only uh, clean um, computable functions that, that these are the only functions. You don't have to be that strict. You don't have to do this recursive uh, mathematics of, of Markov uh, Junior. Um, you can be more um, you can be more uh, colorful <laughs> with your with your functions, um, but you also don't have to be like ha like have everything magically be a function as it is the case in the classical logic. Okay, so. Um, I highlight this with a little bit of Gödel, and this is very similar to the four freebies video I, I gave such examples before. Um, so, um, first, you know, you, you always say um, you have an enumeration of your proofs, and this is similar to um, you know Gödel encoding and enumeration of your programs. You can, if you wish, you can speak about enumeration of all um, C plus plus syntactically correct programs without inputs, something like that. I have videos on my channel where I talk about um, uh, enumerating all the words and stuff like this and, and various um, ordinal explicit computations. So you can do that. You can enumerate all the programs or your proofs in this case of your sound and consistent theory. Um, and then as per, per the Gödel theorem from the 30s, there is a way to already in arithmetic and code this statement that the number n corresponds to a, a, a proof in your enumeration of a certain uh, proposition. In this case, the one of interest is um, zero equals one. So this is this is an inconsistent statement. Once you, once you have proven the inconsistent statement, then your theory breaks down. Everything is provable and so on by explosion. And this uh, predicate that, you know, this is a predicate in just one natural number says um, that that n, the given n, is actually um, proving the inconsistency of your theory, right? And um, this evaluation uh, is primitive recursive. So if you if I give you, say I say 9001, then you can actually say, oh, which uh, proof does this correspond to and what this is a proof of and this is a proof of zero equals one this is like a process like taking a modulo or multiplication in the sense that it's very easy to compute so this is uh, easy to compute so this is a, a primitive recursive function however also as per Gödel the consistency of your theory so this is basically here uh, saying there does not exist a natural number such that the corresponding proof is one of an inconsistency this you can encode as this this uh, negation statement here, right? Um, this is equivalent, even constructively, to uh, like a for all statement. For all natural numbers holds, it's not a proof of an inconsistency. So this is famously uh, unprovable in the sound theory. It's uh, then uh, independent, and you can do. Uh, nice extensions of that Rosser sentence, and then you get rid of extra assumptions. But in, in, in general, the inside is in, with Gödel, you have statements which are independent. And now once you have these statements which are independent, then you can uh, like show that there's a lot of uh, ways to transfer this independence from this one arithmetic object to, to everything else. You can infect your theory, you can, can infect your set theory, you can infect your uh, analysis theory, your um, theory of real numbers with this and uh, sort of infuse, I don't want to say break the system because it's also in a sense nice this, that this is the case, that not everything can be mechanically solved. But um, we will now see how we can use this stuff. Okay. So, um, yeah, the, the fact also that this um, is independent also means that this uh, proof search which um, um, the proof search for um, if the theory is sound for like a, a consist consistency or of a proof of the consistency of the theory 
um, that will uh, you know not, not get you anywhere. If it if it would get you anywhere and the fury is sound, then it would mean that you can arrive at one of those. Okay, um, this is then uh, similar to or related to the sort of stronger recursion theory variant where we speak of um, various halting problems like this Turing stuff that um, I'm going to use to um, break the classical system. <laughs> okay, so. Um, from this uh, P um, predicate, right? So this is, uh, again, the, 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 that says N is an inconsistency, which per assumption uh, we'll never find one because we metalogically assume we're only dealing with a consistent theory, right? Standard assumption uh, always. Okay, so uh, here I define a certain sequence. The, this is a sequence in M, right? So for every M we get a rational number. Um, the number is defined by the sum from n1 to m of these uh, smaller and smaller um, factors. Um, and one, if this primitive recursive uh, uh, function or predicate holds, else zero, right? So if um, the uh, theory is indeed consistent, right, the methodological uh, assumption that we have, then whatever n we check, we will find that is not a proof of an inconsistency, right? And you can do this easily by hand. I give you the first, uh, I don't know, 20 proofs of some um, logic theory or some arithmetic theory or some set theory. And you can look at the proofs and, and check, oh, this is not a proof of an inconsistency, right? Um, so you can easily do the first few by hand. You will find that, okay, this number uh, for every M, like let's say M equals 9,000, you look at the first 9,000 9, proofs, you see, oh, they are all not a proof of inconsistency. This number so far is just 0, 0, 0.000. It's very small. And then the rest you don't know. Um, so clearly, this number for every, if your theory is consistent, for every m, this, 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 uh, this numbers on the sequence always look like just 0, right? Because you never find an inconsistency. And then in analysis, however, you can say, you know, okay, this this has a very nice uh, like convert like this is converges very quickly to something. I take the limit there, and um, I get in this way some real number, right? If, for example, there there might be some proof of inconsistency, then there might be some factors of one over two times something, um, and then it might be not non-zero. Um, in any case, this is some some real number, right? I mean, just by, by in the normal analysis way. So, um, because, however, I cannot for all P prove that this will always be zero, right, as per Gödel, I can also not say, the theory cannot say that, that this limit here um, is a hard zero, right? This is basically, I, I can also not reject it. The P number, will always look like something super tiny. I can always say, oh, for the first uh, one, one trillion things that I looked at, it, it I only found zeros. It will always look like something which must be extremely small. But your theory cannot know if it's actually equal to zero, as by Gödel, right? As because you cannot prove for all natural numbers that this will always be zero. Because then you would prove that your theory is consistent. So as far as um as uh the like an, an explicit check goes or the proof search goes you cannot find uh that this is zero or non-zero right and so if your theory has the disjunction property if a disjunction is only provable if one of the clauses is prov provable i talked about this in the previous video that i linked um then this means that your analysis theory which if you if it's constructive will also not um prove that equality to zero for the sequences in this sense is uh decidable right okay now going on uh, another result which, which you certainly have heard of all these um, halting problem stuff in a sense um the girdle proofs are sort of incorporated in uh, the recursion theory and this kind of thing so once you have that down then uh, Gödel also pops out. Um, here you uh, have then a bunch of other predicates um, with which you can demonstrate all these non-computability shenanigans. In particular, if you look at the, um, this predicate, 
um, in an enumeration of machines, Turing machines or computer programs that says um, the nth program, or the program that you're given in this enumeration will never hold, then then um, the um, collection of all, all indices for the, that this hold has particularly bad uh, properties. Again, um, I have linked this video. I discussed this a little bit in the constructive arithmetic thing. Um, but in particular, this is also here one of the cases where um, you um, cannot constructively prove this infinite disjunction. Um, and so in particular, if you would uh, think to characterize a characteristic function um, that makes use of this m, right? So it's a characteristic function that takes a natural number and says, oh, the nth machine um, holds or does not hold, then uh, since m is uh, undecidable, this will not, in your constructive theory, be a function at all. It is a subset of this set, right? But it's not functional, right? So if it would be functional, that would mean that for all uh, n, you could uh, find out if it uh, holds or not, does not hold, right? You would uh, get from this function immediately the provability of this, this wit a witness of this infinite dis disjunction. So um, this thing, and again, I have here again, uh, this, this P is, is the, the tuple. Um, this thing is by constructive theory, not um, provably in this function space. Uh, and so here you see that the classical theory will think that this, the classical set theory will think that this set is a function, um, defines a function, right? It proves that this thing is a function with respect to its, its the logic you use. But this does not have to be the case in all the, uh, the set theories that I look at if you like um, have this more constructive logic underlying. And um, here the the subset uh, defined by just picking out those natural numbers which um, the corresponding computer program never holds, like the, the subselection of those programs which never hold. This, um, as discussed in the other video, is not even recursively enumerable. And so this is also not a countable set because if it was, then um, you could, um, you could you would have a um, computable enumeration, right? So uh, again, I, I, in this video, I don't prove all this computability theory stuff, but I, I just give you these counter examples. Um, for example, here, uh, the fact that under this um, semantics, you don't have countability of every subset of the natural numbers, right? Because we just demand more, we, we demand a more like computable semantics. Um, function means computable function in the, in the strictest case. But even if we don't go as strict, even if you have something in the spectrum in between, um, there are a lot of like mathematical theories which have like a different opinion on things than the classical theory. So in particular, um, we have that the functions inject into the sets, right? This, this general sets exists. The functions are more strictly in the definition. There's an existential quantifier with an exclamation mark. So uh, we have this order relation in, for this cardinalities, even if, you know, I say order relation, although uh, even in Zemelo Frankel, if the choice not holds, then this is not a total relation even. Um, and, uh, but however, the other way is in general not provable in a constructive theory because <laughs> the, the, this, the, the other direction is um, equivalent to excluded middle. If you, if the the subsets are basically in correspondence with with um, with functions, uh, deciding functions, characteristic functions, that means you can decide the subset uh, property for every set. Um, but we have seen that uh, we can define very complicated subsets, so. This is then uh, excluded middle then. Okay, so uh, then a final note before I come to the list of um, of uh, theorems that do hold. Mm, I want to emphasize that, um, you know, you have a characterizations of the real numbers. There's like tasky characterizations. There are certain properties you can, um, uh, you want and thereby characterize dedicated cards uh, in, a, in a topos and so on and so forth. Um, but I want to highlight that also like functions in a set theory, for example, and this is a very set theory heavy video, 
Um, there you also have like uh, typically the the models where like a Cauchy reel will be uh, an equivalent like every Cauchy reel will be some equivalence class of, of certain uh, uh, sequences of rational numbers and so then there is um, a lot of wriggle room with the individual sequences um, and so in general for example if you have done a Cauchy reel uh, 7 right all the, the the set of all the sequences which uh, in this Cauchy sense go to the 7. The cardinality of this set that represents the number 7 in the Cauchy reels will as be as big in Tamela Frankel as the reels themselves. And at the same time, if you look at another model, like the dedicant numbers, which are these cuts, basically you take the rational numbers and, and uh, define uh, predicates that have a left and right. Then, as, as subsets of the rational numbers, the dedicant real numbers will have a much smaller cardinality in the classical Semedo uh, Frankel theory already, right? So, I just want to emphasize that we speak of real numbers, we mean um, this, uh, you know, this line which extends the rational numbers, has certain completeness properties, hopefully, um, and has, you can put some certain topology on them and so on, so on and so forth. Um, but the, um, the implementation uh, also in C and Z theory is very different, right? You get a bunch of exterior properties, um, the, such that the models are different, and uh, the countability and these sort of things is also sort of Z theoretical, right? You look at the collection of all these objects from the outside, and then you say something about it, how it relates to other sets that you have, right? So um, it should not be too spooky that if by real numbers, you just mean a baseline of properties. And in this paper, for example, they are then characterized as dedicant reals in some topos. They have all these nice properties of the real numbers and you, f you find the rationals in there and so on and so forth. So from a, a user perspective, they look the same, but uh, all these this, uh, properties like cardinality and so on and so forth, which is not really about the numbers, but about like the, their context in your foundations, they might look the, different there. Um, Okay, and so uh, finally, let me go through the um, these properties. Um, I, I, I might just go uh, through them one by one and, and comment on them. So uh, obviously, every number, uh, every set is uh, equal to itself. So you have an uh, identity as an injection. So every number is ordered in, in this injection set with itself. Um, every, se every set is, is ordered here. Uh, every set also injects into its power set. You know, you have this like, like the list monad where you just take something and, and wrap it into something and then you have a, um, not uh, an element of this X but an element of the, the sets of, of X. Okay, makes sense. Um, here is explicitly uh, this map from the function spaces to the, um, the sets also clear and uh, similar here with a discrete uh, set where the equality is discrete. You can also then uh, do this sort of game here. Um, okay, these are all so easy. Then come the, the whole, uh, the classical counter proofs, right? They still hold, like it's still the case that X never subjects into, into X with this classical construction. Um, and similarly, the power set does not inject into the underlying set. It's a similar sort of um, contradiction proof. Um, you have then also the um, this this um, avoidance constructions and in the paper um, in the uh, countable rules paper there's also then a little bit talk about um, sequence um, avoiding um, sets so there's uh, some more proofs there um, and then similarly uh, this is also basically the, an extended counter proof uh, also no a subset of the natural numbers injects into the uh, the power set, right? And I will say something more about this in a second. Um, with countable choice, then or or excluded middle, then you have a fairly classical situation. The Dedekind and Cauchy um, definitions of the real numbers are isomorphic. Um, and uh, because the dedicated reels have nice Cauchy complete uh, properties that then also sort of carries over to the to the uh, 
the the Cauchy reels and um, so if you have countable choice then a lot of these sort of um, magic options are sort of cut out and that's why also this this uh, topos here this topos construction has neither countable choice nor excluded middle um, as I said then the sequence avoiding stuff there's some nice uh, proofs in the talk and in the paper as well but okay um, because uh, you have uh, complicated models of the real numbers um, and the, the digit, digit expansion is like a function, right? You get, like, let's say in base 2, you get for every um, s slot in the expansion, you, you ought to get some number. Um, there's a discrepancy between the, the complicated model of the reals and this uh, ability to do a digit expansion. And so this is something that fails. And then all the proofs which talk about the uncountability of the reals via... Uh, diagonal construction constructions with the di digit expansion they will just not go through right this comes then directly from the fact that these objects like the this sequence spaces which are functions and the, the more generic uh, characterizations of some some real numbers <coughs> like SETI ones because they don't collapse um there these proofs just don't go through um And um, contrary to what I said here, right? Here we said um, an index set, a subset of n cannot subject onto the power set. But because intuitively these function spaces are smaller than the, the power set, it is possible that an index set subjects onto these, these spaces then, right? And so this should, after all that we said before, not be too surprising if you adopt the, the postulate that function space just computes uh, contains con com computable functions then this is like a, the function space just uh, containing programs and because we can enumerate a pro uh, the, the strings and some of them are valid computer programs this also already suggests like in intuitively that um, the functions are all basically just subsets of the natural numbers right and this is also i imagine you must you must think that um the idea that the real numbers are uncountable is younger than the use of the Maxwell equations, right? This is a fairly recent idea. And I imagine uh, like 200 years ago, people thought of also the real numbers in this way, right? You, you basically can all access them and they're all um, computable-ish, right? So I, um, I, I don't have, I've never read like a historical study, but if either people didn't think about it too deeply or there was sort of the intuition uh, and this is sort of realized in this some of this this um these postulates right where you say everything is just computable you don't even think about the non-computable stuff um and yeah the power set of the um of a singleton because by comprehension you can basically use any predicate as complicated as you want and um, use it to define a subset of the singleton. The subset of singleton might like it, it, it's 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 not a bad idea to work with a set theory, but this is actually not a set at all because it's so complicated. Right? This is very different than any function space, like for example this very trivial function space. <coughs> um, this might have like might be a proper class in the sense that you cannot really associate it with um, just a few uh, elements because for every predicate you get basically a, a, a like a whole um, a whole lattice of pred uh, um, pr predicates and thereby subsets which are all contained in this power class. Um, and yeah, as I said, uh, the power set of, of the national numbers but might be very different than this Tamer function space um, and. Um, if, for example, S in um, uh, C, Z, F, if you don't even ac accept the power set axiom, the statement, this uh, uh, pi 1 statement, that every set uh, has a power set, which is also a set, then it's also consistent to say that all uh, sets are subjected into by some subsets of the natural numbers. Basically, everything is just enumerable with some subset of the natural numbers. However, these subsets are generally not decidable sub subsets, right? So this is an axiom which you can adopt su subcountability. Um, but 
there is also an elusiveness that comes into that. This is um, like the same or a similar sort of elusiveness that you get if you uh, adopt the law of excluded middle, right? A bunch of things become very mythical in a sense. Here also, you can say all the all these functions from some some subsets of the natural numbers into onto all of these sets that I have in my theory exist. But this axiom alone won't tell you uh, too much about the subsets uh, that are in injecting or uh, that are subjecting into all um, sets. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit tired already here, but okay. Um, Okay, here's um, a bunch of comments on uh, type theory realizability. This is sort of a, an appealing aspect of it that these frameworks also uh, can be co computerized in this sense. You have these models in, in type theory. Um, and yeah, so uh, I don't discuss in this video topos theory at all, but uh, now it should not be too much of a stretch that you have Dedekind drills and um, spaces that um, they just behave differently because they are not like the classical situation where everything of these things collect into into each other and the reals behave essentially like sequences or something like the the the, the digit expansion, which is also not unique, but you know what I mean. Okay, and and finally uh, to conc to conclude here, um, just other things that uh, you might might want to keep in mind. So, Schröder Bernstein, uh, the fact that in uh, Zemelo Frankel theory or any this classical set theories, if you have like injections in both directions, then they are in bijection. This is equivalent to excluded middle, so you don't have that. Although you have incomputability theory related um, variants of such results. Um, then uh, S better construction that you see here, right? So. Uh, let the number zero be in a set if your theory is consistent, otherwise take it out. Um, it's also like not too hard to understand that a subset of a finite set, right? This is a subset of a finite set, set can be so elusive that you cannot like have a bijection with some other set. Like at least you cannot decide which bijection it is. And therefore, there, therefore like the subsets of the finite sets um, will not in general be finite again, right? F finiteness meaning there's a bijection to a particular uh, set, to a particular uh, finite ordinal in this case. Um, I have made a long video two years ago about um, excluded middle um, being implied by full choice. And then, because I like it, um, I didn't know about this, but I learned about this recently, that there is um, a recent paper that shows the consistency of um, some product of sets in Zimela Frankel theory subjecting into um, these, uh, in the, into the power set in Zimela Frankel theory. Um, obviously, X does not subject into the power set, uh, but only with choice is X always for infinite x always the same as the product of x with itself. So that's an possible, and this is sort of like a hard counter uh, counter example for for choice, basically. Um, and then finally, I want to give a warning because I see this often. Um, it's very tricky to talk about the definable reals inside of a theory. And if people do that, they usually or often blend sort of levels of analysis. They, they blend the level, the pr um, proofs in a theory and the capability of the meta logic. And so there's a bunch of, um, you have to watch out for this. I, I um, There is some discussion, especially by, I think Hemkins is his name, um, on Stack Exchange, Stack Overflow, and uh, also some YouTube video where the issue with these things are discussed. And um, if you know the math, that this is related to countable models of um, Timelo Frankel theory and uh, that relates also to Skolian paradox and so on and so forth. Okay. Okay. Um, so finally, I come back to the list of this recent paper uh, with the countable uh, reals. I hope I have motivated why something like um, these, um, the desirability of this sort of uh, property is. Um, is interesting and fairly non-classical, right? I gave the example why the decidability of some sequence to be the zero sequence um, cannot be decidable computably. 
And so if you have then a, a top boss which validates these things, this is fairly non-constructive. I mean, Markov principle and so on <clears throat> is usually adopted, but this has a bunch of spooky um, properties, but it's designed to be to have this apomorphism into the real numbers and that's why it's a nice result. Okay, so I will leave it at that. I hope this clarified a few things. Leave um, questions in the comment or requests, right? If anything was not super clear, um, I will give you a nice elaboration in the comments as well. Or if you want to see something like an interview or something uh, or, or do, an in do a talk with me, I have thought about this for a longer time. Um, then uh, go ahead and write in the comments, uh, like uh, the video and, and share it and, uh, <laughs> and all that good stuff. Take care and have a nice summer.